Mario's known for being a plumber, but he's had numerous other jobs like doctor, soldier, and rapper? <laughs> In 1992, British DJ Simon Harris made a Super Mario hip-hop song filled with sound effects and music ripped straight from Mario games. He got UK rapper Einstein to do the rap vocals going under the name MC Mario. They even got permission from Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Mario. The song ended up becoming a hit in the UK, making it to number 8 on the UK singles chart. The song was so good, Nintendo even asked Harris to make a full album. So what was the name of the song that became such a big hit you're probably asking? Well, take it away MC Mario. All this just goes to show you how popular Super Mario Land was at the time. Critically, it did well too with game reviewers. But this begs the question, for a game that was so favored back in the early 90s, why is it that no one talks about this game anymore? Even Nintendo barely mentions this game. This game and its sequel, despite being platformers like the rest of the Super Mario Bros games, weren't even considered to be mainline Mario games until the 30th anniversary of the Super Mario Bros series. So I figured we'd go back and explore the Mario series that it seems the world has forgotten. Super Mario Land was developed by Nintendo R&D 1, the team responsible for classics like Donkey Kong, Metroid, and Kid Icarus. It was a launch title for the Game Boy, which was also developed by Nintendo R&D 1, so these guys knew a little something something about making games for the system. The masterminds behind Super Mario Land were directors Satoru Okada and producer Gunpei Yokoi. Noticed how I didn't mention Miyamoto, and that's because Miyamoto had no involvement in this game, making this the first Super Mario game without his presence. And that's probably why this game is so weird. This game doesn't take place in the Mushroom Kingdom. Instead, Mario visits the far off nation of Sarasaland, where you have to save Princess Daisy from the mysterious space alien Tatanga. Speaking of Daisy, the promotional material surrounding this game really played up the romance between Mario and Daisy. Like this commercial. The Martians are coming! Yes, and Mario is your only hope! Challenge the mysteries and terrors of ancient Egypt to give Mario a happy ending and make your world a better place! And also, the rap album I mentioned earlier, there's actually a song where Daisy comes in and spits a couple bars. Mario's Bay is definitely Princess Peach nowadays, but back in the day, Mario was a little bit of a pimp. Peach, Daisy, Pauline, Lady, I guess they just couldn't resist that honker of a nose, huh? Fight! Well, enough about Mario's love life. This game is weird. There's no Luigi, no Peach, no Bowser, no Toad, no Yoshi, no Goombas, no Koopas, no Koopa Kids, no Flagpoles, no Castles, no Fireflowers, no one up Shrooms, but what this game does have are... Super Balls. What? Instead of Fire Flowers, this game has Super Ball Flowers, which give Mario the ability to shoot these bouncy balls that can ricochet off solid surfaces and hurt enemies. Now, I love the Fire Flower, but this is such a cool power-up. You can pull off some sick trick shots with this thing, and the projectiles can even collect coins for you. The Super Ball Flower holds an interesting record, too. It has the record for the power-up with the longest amount of time between appearances. The only other time this power-up appeared was in Super Mario Maker 2, 30 years later, at least for the Japanese Super Mario Land release. The American release of Super Mario Land was a bit later in July of 1989, while Mario Maker 2 was in June of 2019, so for us Westerners, the pain of not being able to see Mario's big bouncy Super Bowls was a little less intense. Huh? Speaking of power-ups, the Starman is in this game too, but if you listen closely, the invincibility jingle is a little bit different than what you're used to. Yeah. This game is weird. So weird that it completely changes the gameplay style in two levels. The second and final world boss levels are shoot 'em ups instead of traditional Mario platforming levels. One is in a submarine and the other is in a fighter plane. It was actually planned in the original Super Mario Brothers for Mario to fly in a rocket or a cloud. It was also planned for Mario to have a gun. 
Anyway, gun violence in a children's game aside, Super Mario Land seems like a dumping ground for a ton of old and strange ideas that could never work in a regular Mario game. Koopas whose shells explode, clouds that try to kill you, and Chinese zombies! Why are Chinese hopping zombies in this game, you might ask? Well, it's because Super Mario Land's worlds are all based on real world locations. The first world is the Birabuto Kingdom, based on ancient Egypt. The second world, the Muda Kingdom, is based on the British island territory, Bermuda. The third world, the Eastern Kingdom, is based on Easter Island. And the final world, the Chai Kingdom, is based on ancient China. I love how unique these level themes are. This whole game is just filled with so much personality and color, despite being in, you know. So I've rambled on and on about how cool and original and interesting this game is, but who cares? I know what you guys really want to know. Is the game good? Yeah, it's alright. It's not the best Mario game, but it still is a fun ride. The biggest complaints most people have are the physics and the game's length. Mario's physics feel... off. He goes from 0 to 100 real quick. In most Mario games, it takes time for Mario to gain speed. His jump is also really stiff here, not allowing for much control in the air, especially if you jump while moving. As for the game's length, there are only 12 levels in this game. The game is incredibly short. I beat it in under an hour. Now, personally, I don't mind a quicker runtime. I actually prefer my game short and sweet. Developers tend to pad games out with filler content to make it feel like you're getting your money's worth, when in reality, it hurts the overall enjoyment factor. Though, who knows, maybe if I bought this game back in 1989 for full price, I'd probably feel some type of way too. So, I get why people might not care so much for this one, but this game did get a sequel, Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins. So, let's see if this one is any good. It's awesome! Mario Land 2 was released in 1992, three years after the first game, and not too long after the American release of Super Mario World. And this game has a number of things in common with Mario World. Mario's sprite is very similar to the one in World, the spin jump is here, there's a world map too, this game feels kinda like a portable Mario World. In fact, for the simplified Chinese version of the game, the title of this game is not Super Mario Land 2, but instead it is Mario World Second Episode. Not only does this game feel like Mario World, it feels, well, more like a Mario game in general. They even took out the Super Bowl flower and gave us the Fire Flower back, albeit with a slightly different look due to the Game Boy's color limitations. We did get a new power-up, the Carrot, which turns Mario into a, a, a bunny version of himself, but it's very similar to the Raccoon Leaf from Mario 3, although admittedly, this one is a lot better as you can float for insanely long if you mash the A button. This return to form was surprising considering the first Mario Land was so different. And originally, the game was supposed to be even more different from your traditional Mario game. In fact, it was so different that the first draft of the game was turned down because it was too different from a regular Mario game. So the team decided to scale it back and bring it a little closer to home. But here's the thing, I lied. This game is very different from Super Mario World and traditional Mario games in general. You just gotta look beyond the surface and peel back the layers a little bit. Example 1. This game has no princesses. Mario doesn't save anyone. You see, this game is a direct sequel to the original Super Mario Land, which in and of itself is a really novel idea. Mario games are notoriously pretty loose when it comes to stories. After defeating the magic alien guy, Tatanga, and rescuing Daisy, Mario decides to take a trip back to his private island. Oh, you didn't know he had that? Yeah. Well, I guess when you have 17 different jobs, you probably have a pretty fat bank account. And you want to know what his island is called? Mario Land. It all comes full circle, folks. I guess Mario lives in that dingy shack in the Mario RPGs to keep a low profile. Can't have the local toads begging for handouts. But upon returning, he realizes that his castle, because yeah, he has a castle too, has been taken over by his arch rival, Wario. Because yeah, apparently he has an arch rival now too. There's actually a Nintendo Power comic called Mario vs. Wario that goes into the backstory of Mario and Wario's rivalry. Wario managed to take over Mario's entire island while Mario was off saving Sarasa Land in the original Super Mario Land. And considering Tatanga actually returns in this game too as a boss, it's very likely Wario was the mastermind behind the events of the first game too. 
That's a really cool piece of world building there. Mario must go to the six different worlds in Mario Land and recover the six magical coins to allow him access to his castle, where he can fight Wario and win back his land. The devs for this game thought that since Mario's always rescuing someone else, it would be nice for Mario to truly do something for himself for once, and man, I really like that. Not only is the goal of this game very different, so is the world itself. Mario games are usually fairly linear in stage progression. You go from one world to the next, and occasionally you might have a branching path or a place to get items. However, Mario Land 2 is somewhat open world. While progression in each world is linear for the most part, you can tackle any world in any order you want. I love this approach, as it allows for the freedom for you to play how you want and it helps that all of the game's worlds are awesome. The six worlds in this game are Tree Zone, Turtle Zone, Space Zone, Macro Zone, Pumpkin Zone, and Mario Zone. Some of these zones have really unique themes, like the Pumpkin Zone, which is an entire world based on horror icons like vampires, Japanese yokai goats, and even Jason Voorhees. My favorite world though has to be the Mario Zone, which is an entire world taking place within a huge Mario robot. There's even a level in Mario's... um... And if we go inside the level... They knew what they were doing when they made this level background. Even the enemies shoot balls, and they've got these cute little guys balancing on these bouncy balls. Okay, who brought in their 12-year-old son to design this level? The Mario series has had this stigma for a while where it never tries anything new, especially in the early 2010s at the height of the new Super Mario Bros. era. Many of the worlds used in these games have the exact same themes and gimmicks as previous games. We knew we were getting a grass level, we knew we were getting a desert level, an ice level, etc, etc. But Mario Land 2 really gave us some creative concepts. You know how Mario Galaxy is known for being in space and having low gravity? Yeah, this game already did that. You know how Mario 3 World had that cool dojo level? Yeah, this game had a dojo section before that. Even the more basic world concepts did things to make each level stand out and be different. Take the Turtle Zone for example, it seems like your basic water world, and the first level is just that, a typical beach level. You know, it's just a little warm up to get your feet wet. But the second level takes place in an abandoned submarine. Then the third level gets even crazier since it takes place inside of a whale's mouth. You have to avoid their gnarly looking sharp teeth and use the gunk in its mouth to float over obstacles. It's such a cool idea and the sense of progression in these stages is great. Like in the Mario Zone, you start in Mario's feet and then slowly move your way up through his body until the last level inside of his brain, which is filled with Legos for some reason. This game also has some secret exits, so exploration is encouraged as well. Mario Land is easily one of my favorite locales in a Mario game. It's open-ended, but still focused. It's bigger than Mario Land 1's world, but still a fairly short and sweet game lasting around 3 hours. And the unique levels, man, they are so cool. When people talk about great Mario levels, no one brings up Desert Level 5 or Ice Level 6. They bring up the special levels, like the Van Gogh-styled Painted Swampland from Mario U, or the Super Mario Kart-themed Mount Mustache from 3D World, or the New York-inspired celebration of Mario's history that is New Donk City from Odyssey. Nintendo has proven time and time again that they have the most creative minds in gaming history. I just wish they took advantage of that more, because they certainly did in this game. I haven't really talked much about Wario, but he is an awesome villain. While Bowser is Mario's nemesis, Wario is his rival, and there's a big difference between the two. A nemesis is an antagonist that acts as the big bad evil guy, but a rival is a more personal foe that the protagonist has more in common with. Wario's characterization is very greedy and a lot more goofy, especially in the WarioWare series, but in his first appearance, he was psycho! Obey me, Wario! I am your master! Destroy Mario! Don't fall under Wario's evil spell in Super Mario Land 2! Just look at the crazy eyes in his sprite, man, I love it! Wario was designed by the director of the game, Hiroji Kiyotake, who shared directorial and designer duties with Takehiko Hosokawa, 
Wario's relationship to Mario was inspired by Bluto's relationship to Popeye. This is funny considering originally Miyamoto and Nintendo had plans to make a Popeye arcade game, but it fell through, so instead we got Donkey Kong. Remember how earlier I said Mario Land was the dumping ground for old and strange ideas? Yeah, it runs that deep. While I can understand overlooking the first Mario Land game, it was a unique yet flawed game, but Mario Land 2? This game definitely deserves more love. I'd say this is legitimately one of the best 2D Mario games. There was one more game in the series, Wario Land Super Mario Land 3, but that one is more of a Wario game obviously, being the first game in the Wario Land line that would basically end up taking over the Mario Land series, getting two more games on the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, and several more games after that. But eventually, that series would die out in favor of the new WarioWare series that I absolutely adore. Maybe I'll talk about those games someday. But as you can see, these games have had a huge impact on the franchise. It gave us Daisy, who has gone on to become a popular character, even landing a spot on the Smash Bros roster in Ultimate. The real world level inspiration is something that Mario Odyssey would eventually use. And correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I believe Mario Land 1 is the first ever Mario game where we see Mario talk. Mario Land 2's biggest contribution to the Mario mythos is of course Wario, and I don't think I need to explain how much of an icon he's become. Wario has had more games than Peach, Yoshi, and even Luigi! You know, the other guy that makes up the titular Super Mario Bros? Nope. Not only is this series important to the Mario franchise, it's important to gaming history. Like I said, Mario Land 1 was a launch title for the Game Boy, the most iconic handheld game console of all time. The handheld that practically started handheld gaming as we know it today. Back in the late 80s, portable consoles were practically non-existent. We had the Tiger Electronics and the Game & Watch stuff, but those were just fun little distractions. The Game Boy was like a home console, but on the go. If this thing flopped, the portable gaming market would have been held back by who knows how long. I'm sure eventually someone else would come along, maybe today instead of praising the Game Boy we'd be talking about how revolutionary the Atari Lynx was. So what has me confused is, for such an important Mario subseries, why is it not more appreciated? And I think the main reason is Nintendo themselves. While I will give Nintendo credit for recognizing these games in the 30th anniversary, they've done little to promote these games. Case in point, in the 30 years it's been since Super Mario Land 2 came out, Nintendo has re-released these games a total of one time. Yes, just once in 2011, over a decade ago, on the Nintendo 3DS Virtual Console, you know, the service that's gonna be completely unavailable in less than a year. If Nintendo gave us a Mario Land All-Stars pack, or heck, even just re-release these games on Switch, it'd do a lot to preserve these titles and allow more people to appreciate them. Because as it is now, there are very few ways to even play this series. And as I've said before on this channel, one of the biggest factors of a game's success is accessibility. No one is going to like these games if no one can play these games. There have been some rumors about the Switch getting GBA and Game Boy games on the Switch Online service, so hopefully we get these games on there. As for why Nintendo has been so reluctant to re-release these games, I don't really know. Maybe it's because the guys who made, well, all of the other mainline Mario games didn't make any of the Mario Land games. These are the only mainline Mario games with no involvement from any of the big three of Miyamoto, Takashi Tezuka, and Koji Kondo. Maybe Miyamoto and co don't care too much for these games since, well, they didn't make them. I'm not gonna make any definitive statements. Maybe these games are just too different from the regular Mario games. Maybe Nintendo doesn't think they'll sell well if they release them. Who knows? I just hope these games are remembered and loved. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please click the like button. It takes less than five seconds and it really helps the channel grow. If you want to see more videos like this one, then please click the subscribe button too. It won't cost you anything. Thanks guys. Always remember where you came from and have a good one.